Thanks, guys. Good job. Okay, first agenda item. We have to get rid of the little box back here. I don't think I need it. Thank you for coming. It's an honor to speak with you today. Over the last four months or so, as my wife and I, who most of you know now, is also named Connie, so it gets very confusing, as we have tried to disengage from a community that we've been part of for 25 years, uh, we've done a lot of, oh, well, this is the last time we'll do this. It's a lot more fun to do, this is the first time. So this is a, a great opportunity to address you for the first time in this particular kind of context. Uh, I do bring uh, greetings and regrets from my wife Connie. She desperately wanted to be here, but as, as uh, Jennifer said, uh, we have a house that we had been in for a long time. It had a full basement in every sense of that word, and uh, she's, she's working on that, but, um, but she wishes she could be here and looks forward to meeting you. It is an honor to be here. It's an honor for, to have such distinguished uh, colleagues, distinguished students, because I, you have distinguished yourselves already by joining us and being, uh, being part of our community, and distinguished visitors, the Board of Trustees, but especially I want to lift up President Emeritus Webb. Uh, it's been noted already that he and I are probably at opposite ends of the bell curve of presidential height distributions. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I am quite mindful of the shoulders of the giants that I stand on, and he is certainly among them. So thank you for your presence here. There's been some conversation. I'm grateful for uh, Dr. Ward's reference of, of imperfect vision. I may have to refer to my reading glasses here at some point. I want to make clear what I think we're doing today. We've begun a conversation on campus about a vision, and I've shared with the faculty and staff some elements of my vision, and I can certainly talk to you about those very, very succinctly, but very passionately. But we're beginning a process of strategic planning, and that process involves me learning from you and listening to you. There's an old saying that's frequently attributed to the management guru Peter Drucker, culture eats strategy for breakfast. I need to learn the culture and learn how we fit my vision. I can tell you the elements of my vision. We will be excellent. We will be Shreveport Bossier's College. We will be deeply engaged with the community. We will be open. We will be transparent. We will hold each other up. But fleshing that out is for the months to come. Instead, today I'm speaking to our freshmen. That's the point of this ceremony. Convocations have a long history, going back into the 1500s. They're usually, they're used for all manner of events, for welcoming new presidents, for opening buildings, for uh, all sorts of things, but most frequently used for what we're doing today to begin a new academic year, to welcome you into a community, a community of scholars that has learning as its highest value and its prime goal. We also intend for this service to serve as a bookend to commencement, a parallel ceremony that you will be going through. And of course, it's a little bit confusing, right? Because commencement sounds like you're starting something, and, and here we, you know, so. And in fact, some colleges and one university I attended call their graduations convocations, so it gets even more confusing. We call commencements commencements to note that they're the beginning of something, the beginning of the next stage of your life. But today's convocation begins something for all of us together. It's the beginning of your journey through Centenary. It's the beginning of other journeys today. As I said to you, uh, most of you at orientation a couple, of year, uh, a couple of weeks ago, the class of 2020 will always be special to me since we've started together. And sure enough, this is obviously the beginning of a new journey for me. It's a new journey for us together as a Centenary community and for Centenary as a college. And so on that last point, I want to challenge my colleagues to my, my left, uh, my faculty, staff, and board colleagues. I am directing my comments today to our new students, but I know that you're skilled at making connections, so I leave it to you as a challenge to fill in the blanks, 
between my comments to the freshmen and our ongoing work that we've already begun on our journey together. So I want to talk to you just a little bit today about journeys. I'm going to give you a little bit of advice, maybe some fun facts to know and tell, some things that might come in handy in a class someday. Maybe some advice. I can hear some of you groaning already saying, eh, that sounds like a commencement speech I just sat through. Uh, but I promise you there'll be some useful tidbits and it'll be shorter than most commencement speeches. Journeying is one of the core experiences of human existence. We see that reflected in how often we see journeys in literature. We have great sagas of journeys going all the way back to the journeys of Ulysses that Homer wrote about almost 3,000 years ago, all the way up to the journey of Frodo Baggins, the people on the amazing race. And virtually every video game is structured around a journey. We have great literature about journeying, the Okies and the Grapes of Wrath, fleeing from the Dust Bowl of the Depression. And in these times when Christians and Jews and Muslims seem to have such trouble communicating to each other, it's worth remembering that they all stem from the journey of Father Abraham, whose first obedience to God at age 75 was to go on a journey from what is today Iraq to what is today Israel. So I'd like to suggest to you today that we can learn some things about these journeys we are starting on by considering what we know from having thought about journeys for so long as, a, as an existence, as mankind. First, what seems, I, I usually walk around more, but I'm really scared that if I step backwards, uh, things will go, go crazy wrong. So, uh, so excuse me if I'm a little more pinned to this podium than I'm used to. What seems like the most important thing about a journey is what? Is the destination. You have to know where you're going, right? The Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu, uh, about, uh, he lived about 500 BC, and he's credited with the uh, expression that's become a cliche. The longest journey begins with a single step. Well, that's true. Uh, the modern author, Chuck Palahniuk, who wrote Fight Club, said, yeah, but a journey to nowhere starts with a single step, too. <laughs> it's important that we have a goal. On the other hand, our consideration over time of journeys teaches us a couple of things. One is that even if you have a very clear goal in sight when you start, you may not reach that goal. You might encounter obstacles. You might encounter a side trip that's so much more interesting than what you set out for, you keep going in that direction. And more importantly, you might recognize that the destination you set for yourself wasn't the right one anyway. I encourage you not to be so focused on what today you think is your goal so that you shut out the possibility of new destinations. You're probably familiar with the poem by Robert Frost about a road less traveled by and the path that's made all the difference. Well, that poem is badly misinterpreted most of the time, and I leave that for you to talk with your English professors about. But it has a grain of truth even in our misunderstood, received wisdom about that poem. One of the most important aspects of college is the ability, the opportunity to explore different destinations that you might not have even been aware existed. The second important thing about your journey is the people around you. You are not alone on this journey. Sometimes as we journey, sometimes we journey with others. And when we journey with others, you learn things about people that you don't learn in other ways. Traveling together as you are with shared interests only increases that bond. A while ago, I was a member of a board that only meets four time, met four times a year. For those of you in the United Methodist tradition, it was the Board of Ordained Ministry for my annual conference. The work in that group is intense. The stakes are high. We only met four times a year, and one of the meetings was for almost a week long. The chairman of that group always called us to order with the phrase, companions on the journey. And that stuck with me. I was fortunate enough to be able to go on a pilgrimage to Assisi a few years ago, and that was the way our little band of pilgrims felt about each other. We were more than just people who happened to be on the same tour. 
We were, in fact, companions on the journey. Some of you have come to Centenary with friends from high school. Some of you have come alone. Some of you have come from other continents. But in any case, it's critically important that you find new companions for this journey, companions that you can lean on, learn from, and rely on. But not all of our journeys are in groups. Some of our journeys are solitary. But even on solitary journeys, you meet people that can influence you and that can help you. The faculty and staff here at Centenary are also part of your journey. We've made the trip ourselves. And we've seen others walk that path. We can direct you. We can point out, as some of you experienced in Paris, we can point out some interesting features, some fun side trips, maybe point out some dangers. There's a parable that was uh, most famously retold on an episode of The West Wing where a man's walking down the street and he falls in a hole and it's, the sides are so steep he can't get out and uh, he looks up and there's a doctor walking by and he says, doctor, can you help me out? And the doctor sort of mindlessly scribbles a prescription, throws it down the hole and keeps walking. Priest walks by and he says, father, can you help me out? And the priest sort of mindlessly scribbles a prayer and drops it down the hole. Obviously not a United Methodist minister. <laughs> and then finally he sees a friend walking by and he says, Joe, I'm down in this hole, can you help me out? And Joe jumps down into the hole and he says, this is great. Now how are we going to get out? <laughs> he says, I've been down here before. I know the way out. The faculty and staff at Centenary College, if you're in a hole, somebody around has been in that hole and we can help you out. But in the end, it is your journey. Travel it with, with eyes wide open for fellow travelers and for guides that can make the trip most fruitful. Finally, and really most importantly, is what happens to you on the way. Journeys change us. It's not a coincidence, I don't think, that every major religion that I'm aware of has journeying as part of its spiritual life. Probably most famously is that one of the pillars of Islam that all Muslims are required, encouraged to do in their lifetime is to make the Hajj to Mecca. But that's not unique. Buddhists make a pilgrimage to various holy mountains in the Himalayas and walk around the mountain. Now, there's a great book called The Way of the White Clouds. I, I lift that up to you as a, an, a fun book about that sort of thing as a way of achieving a light enlightenment. And of course, Christians make pilgrimages to many places, to Assisi, to Lourdes. There's another famous group of pilgrims in literature, those in the Canterbury Tales. They were on a pilgrimage. They are on a pilgrimage from London to where? Canterbury, believe it or not, right? I mean, what a surprise. In one of the great historical journeys in the Bible, Moses leads a band of ragtag former slaves. Yes, they were the Israelites, but don't you think there were also other people that took advantage of this to escape the oppression of the Egyptians? And they wandered around in the desert for 40 years. Do you think they were lost? I mean, God was guiding them with a pillar of smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night. God was using the journey, using the pilgrimage to create a community, to create a nation. Journeys change us. Now some of these changes will happen whether you're aware of them or not, and whether you do anything about them or not. When you graduate from centenary, you will inevitably be older. <laughs> you will almost certainly be at least a little wiser. But the most profound changes take place if you are aware of them and embrace them. Embrace the transforming power of journeying. The act of journeying gives us an opportunity to make meaning of our lives. One of our goals at Centenary is to give you the tools to live an examined life. Who are you? Who do you want to be? How are your choices that you make going to affect that? And how can your journey help you answer those questions? Although I believe we are in fact shaped by forces around us, we are not at the whim of those forces like a piece of wood floating on a stream. 
Instead, we recognize how our environment affects us and shapes us, how we adapt to those forces and use them on our journey. If at commencement you find yourself the same person that you are today, we at Centenary have failed you, and you have failed to take advantage of a unique opportunity. I am confident that that will not happen. So welcome to an exciting journey. Be open to new destinations and adventures on the way. Find new companions on your journey. Be a good companion yourself and use the journey as a time for learning. Learning especially about yourself. The famous German philosopher once said, Martin Buber, all journeys have secret destinations of which the traveler is unaware. I like that so much I'm going to say it again. All journeys have secret destinations of which the traveler is unaware. Good luck discovering those secrets. Good luck with, for my colleagues as we work together on Centenary's journey. I look forward to continuing to welcome you today, watching your journey, and shaking your hand again at commencement. Thank you very much.